Uh, a few years ago, um, Blanchard, Stony Brook, and Westford Academy partnered with Challenge Success, which is an organization out of Stanford University, which uh, helped us to collect a lot of data um, in terms of how our students were experiencing school. Um, as a very high-performing district, one of the things that we are concerned about is the stress that, uh, that the work and just the experience overall can, can be inducing. And the parents came up with this wonderful idea this evening, which was to talk about um, alternative versions of success, if you will, or just even the, the name of challenge success in the first place. You know, are we going to challenge what we think success is? And so tonight's success stories came from the parents thinking this would be great to get uh, a group of people who would volunteer their time to talk to us about their story and that some of the stories aren't necessarily the stereotypical things that we think of. And so that's what this evening is about. We're going to hear from seven wonderful people who have volunteered their time to come here tonight. To get started, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Jen Petro Roy. Thank you. Um, thank you for pronouncing my last name right. That's very rare, uh, so I appreciate it. Um, as um, he said, my name is Jen Petro Roy. I live in Chelmsford now. I grew up in Chelmsford as well. Um, and I am currently a author and stay-at-home mom with my kids. So I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about how I got there. Um, so when I graduated high school in 2000, um, I was 11th in my class of 360, and I was very proud of that. At one point, I'd even been 10. Um, for some reason, I was really obsessed with that. I wanted to make sure that I graduated in the top 10. I didn't. I just missed out. Um, and for me back then, things like that were really important. Um, you see, I had been a smart kid growing up in elementary school and middle school and going on to high school. Um, I was one of those kids that was in the honors programs, who took the AP classes, and who was involved, involved in a lot of activities. Um, and people knew that. People complimented me on that. Um, so I valued that class rank. I valued that list of activities next to my name in the yearbook. Um, they became part of how I defined myself and how I was. It meant that I was going places. Um, people thought, you know, you graduated, you got, went to a good college, you got a good job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I was going places. I wasn't exactly sure where those places were, if I wanted to actually go to those places, but that's what I planned to do. Um, when I went away to college, I got into a good college, and I knew that I wanted to major in English. I had always loved reading, and I always loved writing, and I figured that I wanted to be an English teacher. So I didn't major in education, I majored in English just in case to keep my options open. Um, but I followed that path, because I still valued those landmarks that people put in place for me. Um, GPA, grades, college choices, good classes. Excuse the notes, just want them here just in case. So I didn't realize how much numbers would grow to be a part of my life back then, not just GPA or grades, and how much they would derail that future that I was hoping for. So when I went off to college, I was really nervous. Um, for those in middle school or college, or those who are in college who are here, you might have felt the same way. Um, I was absolutely terrified. Um, as I said, I had been really successful in high school. I had known my friends since elementary school, some since earlier than that. Um, I was involved in a lot of things, and people talked about me because of those things. You know, I was Jen the swimmer. I was Jen who was on yearbook staff. And I was afraid when I went away to college that there wouldn't be anything left to attach to my name. I would be just Jen, and I really wasn't sure what that was um, once those layers were all stripped away. I was afraid that without all those kind of qualifiers that I wouldn't be enough deep down. Um, I was afraid people wouldn't like me, that they wouldn't want to be friends with me. I was afraid college would be harder than high school, and what if I got bad grades? What would happen then? Um, I also worried about how I looked. I went to a college that was very appearance-focused, or so it seemed to me at the moment, and I was very scared that I wouldn't be as pretty as my new classmates, or as thin as them. So I decided that I would go on a diet so that no one would reject me.
So before I start, college started, I did that. Um, I worked out a little bit more, and I lost some weight. I got some compliments, and I decided to keep going. Um, in my mind, that was a little extra protection. You know, if I looked good, then people would like me, right? And I was so invested in this plan that on the first morning, my first full day at college, I had a few girls who I had met ask me if I wanted to hang out with them, and I said, no, I have to go to the gym instead. Um, because in my mind, that was something that was going to make me friends, and I completely d ignored the fact that I was not doing the exact thing that would actually make me friends, which was actually being with people. Um, but in my mind, that logic didn't really make sense, and it just it made me feel better. So what started out as a simple plan became a habit. Um, it became an addiction of sorts, and it became an eating disorder, uh, one that pulled me away from that path, that life I had planned and was supposed to have, um, the one I was excited about but was really scared about at the same time. And when I got sick, I couldn't think of anything other than how much I weighed or what I looked like. Um, I started skipping classes or leaving classes early to go to the gym. And I became really proud that I ate less than my classmates, completely disregarding the fact that, you know, they were actually doing things that they could be proud of. They were making friends. They were, you know, doing well on papers. Um, and I still was doing well, but my whole self wasn't there and my whole mind wasn't there. So after my freshman year of college, I transferred and I eventually ended up transferring colleges twice and taking a total of a year and a half off within that time when I was in college to attend various forms of treatment. Um, so initially I thought I was gonna go to college, go to four years of college, go to four years of grad school or something like that, get a good job and you know, be on my merry way. Um, but you know, while all my high school friends were going on with their careers and were learning things and doing internships and getting jobs, I was in treatment and I was learning how to eat and I had people watching me while I ate and it made me feel like a child again and basically reduced me to that. Um, and I became very ashamed of that and when people asked me why I was living at home, while people asked me why I had left school if I was getting good grades. Um, so I kept it inside for a long time and I eventually got better. Um, it took a lot of work and a lot of time and many relapses, um, getting better, then getting worse, getting better, then getting worse. Um, and I know a lot of kids nowadays struggle with some sort of mental illness, with, with, ugh, excuse me, whether it's anxiety or depression or eating disorder or anything like that. And one thing I try to tell people when I speak about this is that recovery takes a long time, whatever type of thing that you're dealing with. It can take ups and downs and it can take a lot of different paths. And for me, I needed to take that time off in order to take care of myself, in order to go to therapy and treatment, um, in order to realize that I needed medication because my brain chemicals were out of whack. And success is realizing that your path doesn't necessarily have to be the path that others take because you are a different person and you were born a different way. And you know, as I realized throughout my journey, you know, my body looks different than other people's. My brain looks different. And the way I need to cope with certain situations was different as well. Um, so I w eventually went back to college. I transferred to a college that was near my home and I commuted. And it wasn't what I had anticipated originally. I thought I would go off and you know, make all these friends and you know, have the best time of my life. But it didn't work that way. Um, but I went to graduate school. I got a degree in library science and I became a librarian and then I became a writer. Um, after I had two kids and got married, got married and then had two kids, um, <laughs> I decided that during my daughter's nap times, I would start writing. It's something I'd always wanted to do. So I write a book and I wrote a book, I got an agent and I thought that book would get published and it didn't. It got rejected by many, many publishers. So I wrote another book, which wasn't that great and another book, and another book. And my fifth book, which was called P.S. I Miss You, came out this past March. Um, and I have two more coming out in, in three weeks from today, actually. And these two are on eating disorders. Um, so I kind of wanted to write something that would help middle schoolers and high schoolers kind of learn from what I've gone through. One's fiction, and it's about a 12-year-old girl who's recovering, much like I did. Her path takes a lot of ups and downs. And the other one's a nonfiction guide to recovery for that same age group. Um, so for me, success was kind of realizing that it's okay to open myself up and tell people about how I was struggling and that eventually, no matter what path I take, it will end up where I, I needed to be.
Um, our next speaker is Nicholas Amato. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, like he had said, my name is Nicholas Amato. Um, I am not going to continue the tradition and tell you where I graduated in my high school class because it might make everything else I say irrelevant, so everyone else is off the hook on that. Um, as I started thinking about um, what I was going to say for this talk, I came across a joke um, that adults are always asking little kids what they want to be when they grow up because they're looking for ideas. <laughs> and the more I thought about it, this is actually, that might be the best idea, the best reason why we're asking little kids, five-year-olds, even middle school and high school kids, what do you want to be, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Kids that age, whatever they end up doing might not exist yet. That job might not have been created yet. Things could change so much. Um, I think we've all probably been asked that question and probably done that project in school. I can remember coming home from kindergarten or first grade with my little coloring project and worksheet that said, my name is Nicholas and I want to be a firefighter. And I can remember my mom's look. She said, since when? I said, I, I don't know, since this morning when that lady at the school asked me. Because I thought that was the right answer. I was trying to do what I was supposed to do. I knew I had a firefighter helmet at home. I had a sheriff's badge and I had a plastic stethoscope. One of those answers had to be right and I wanted to be right. I couldn't say that I wanted to be Luigi from Super Mario Brothers because that would ask, that would add a bunch of new questions that I had to answer. Um, so I think better questions that we should be asking kids are what do you like to do? Kids that are this young, what makes you happy at school? What's your favorite thing to do? As they get a little bit older, um, maybe things like what comes easy for you that you think other people struggle with? Maybe the opposite, what do you struggle with that you see other people doing with ease? Um, and for middle school and high school kids that might be here, how do you measure success? Or, or what is success to you? Later in life, how will you determine whether or not you are a success? And the fact that everyone is here actually thinking about this now is a good sign. You're way ahead of was at your age. Um, and that brings up um, another point I wanted to talk about. My wife loves games, and she has this deck of cards um, for conversation starters. Not so much a game. Um, and the last family gathering we had, she brought it out. I rolled my eyes like always. And um, we started asking these questions and going around and having conversations. And one of the questions was just that. How do you measure success? So as I was trying to figure out what I was going to say when it was my turn, I heard a voice that was very similar to my dad's and he said simply, money. And that kind of shocked me because nothing he had done in his life, no decision, had ever been made based on money. So he kind of took the easy way out, like I did by saying I wanted to be a firefighter, because he thought that was the right thing to say. Um, not to say he wasn't a good provider. I never went without anything. Some people might say I was spoiled. Um, but money was an important thing to him. He actually, big time blue collar guy, worked in Westford um, at Murray Printing and then Courier. Um, which is no longer there, but he would come home every day covered in ink, paper dust, grease, just filthy, sweat. But he came home at 2 o'clock, so that was the key. He worked first shift, 6 to 2, busted his butt, but then was home when the sun was still out. He could go fishing, we could play catch, we could play basketball, we could hang out. If I had trouble with homework, he could say, wait till your mother gets home. She'll, she'll, that won't take too long. Um, and while I started to think about this, I realized that I have a lot of those same values. I didn't realize until the last couple weeks how much he had influenced me. So I realized I'm supposed to be talking about me and not my dad, so I'll get to that point now. Um, I realized whenever I need to make a big decision, um, and here's some of the big ones, whenever I need a big decision, I need all the information possible. And if I don't have enough information, I drag my feet. And it takes longer. And I kind of avoid it. Um, case in point, I didn't get married until I was 37. And then two weeks later was my 38th birthday. A lot later than I had expected. 
worked out fantastic for me. My wife is in the audience, I have to say that. You could wave. Um, like I said, though, my dad was a blue-collar worker. I couldn't wait till my late 30s to make a decision about school or a career um, because we weren't just independently wealthy. So I had to make those decisions sooner um, than I would have liked. College first. Where am I going to go to college? Um, I'm an only child. Neither parent went to college. So I didn't have a lot. Um, we didn't have a lot of experience as a family on, on how to go about doing that. Um, they very generously made the deal that anywhere that I was accepted to, they would do their best to make it work. So, funnily enough, the first piece of mail that came was from USC, University of Southern California. So I'm holding the envelope before anyone else said it and said, hey mom, what, what was that deal that we made? Of course, there were apparently some stipulations to the deal. Um, Southern California was out of the question. But I also realized I didn't want to be that far from home. So that narrowed the pool down quite a bit. Um, I knew I wanted to stay in New England. So we started looking at colleges. The first two tours that I remember going on were Merrimack and BU. Um, I don't know exactly what the enrollment is now, but probably like 3,500 for Merrimack, 16,000 or higher at least for BU. Um, and by looking at two very different schools early on, I was able to narrow down the pool um, very quickly again. Merrimack, Took about 20 minutes to walk around. BU, we were told, sign in, go out the door, get on the green line, and I was immediately out. I knew I didn't want to be in a school like BU. It was too big for me. So long story short, I ended up at Assumption College, which was a perfect fit for me. I kind of dragged my feet on that, but it ended up working out well. Um, I was a computer science major. I ended up graduating with an economics degree. And I've been teaching middle school English for 13 years. So. <laughs> How did all that happen? Um, the computer science bit, I thought I was going to be the next Bill Gates. Um, my roommate was also a, a computer teacher. We went to the first class. Everything was great. Looking over the syllabus, we took great notes. We're doing the homework together. We're on this. Second class, we show up, and the professor went from zero to 100. It's now, you need to write a program that's going to calculate. I said, what? So the conversation leaving that class went something like this. Um, was that a little confusing to you? Yeah. Did it seem like he skipped a lot of steps from class one to two? Yeah, definitely. I thought the progression was a little odd too. Do you think we bought the wrong textbook? We honestly had that conversation with each other. So then I'm really scared because I need to declare a major. So again, like choosing a firefighter, I made the decision to be a business major, specifically economics, because I thought that was the right thing to do. Um, the economy was good, whatever that means to a 19-year-old. Um, didn't have any problem getting hired. So I had five or six job offers before graduation, so that was definitely a positive. I chose one, it doesn't matter which one because they're all essentially the same, um, in a cubicle, entry level. The work was very monotonous, um, and I just wasn't happy. Um, I gave it a year and had to give up. Nothing was changing. I was doing things quicker, and I wasn't being given more or more difficult tasks to do. So I was wallowing away in a cube. Um, I started thinking back to a conversation I had with my dad. I very vividly remember him saying, why don't you become a teacher? I'm still in high school. You're good at school. You enjoy English. The thought of standing in front of a group of people, any age, kids especially, all day, terrified me. Um, but I had worked at a group, and um, got along well with kids. Um, my boss there had suggested I be a teacher as well. So that kind of planted the thought in my head a little bit more. Um, I, I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to wrap up quickly. Um, but long story short, I left my financial job. I signed up to take a class about being a substitute teacher. I reached out to my old boss at the rec center and started working an after school program. I worked at a hardware store during the day, and I started taking classes, um, and I took the MTELs to become a teacher. Um, everything kind of fell into place. So the career that I was kind of told that I should have, I wasn't willing to accept because I didn't, I was scared to admit to myself that, hey, maybe this is the right thing to do for me. Um, so 
That's my biggest piece of advice. Your path is going to look different than mine, is going to look different than everyone else's. You will be able to figure it out. Take a deep breath, you have time. Um, the fact that everyone is here is, is definitely awesome to see so many people and you're actually thinking about your future, but you have to figure out what that means to you. Is the microphone holding out? Okay, okay, went in and out a couple times. Um, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Joy Hosford is our next speaker. Good evening, everyone. Um, like I was uh, announced, my name is Joy. I am the Westford Eagle and Littleton Independent reporter. I've been with Gatehouse Media for the last four years. I've been a reporter for the last 10 years. This is my 10th year in the field. Um, I jumped into reporting right after college. Um, I grew up pretty far away from here. Not far away if you're from where I'm from. I'm from Sturbridge, so if you drive anywhere that's less than a half an hour, you're doing good. But um, Sturbridge is at the bottom of the state right on the Connecticut border. You've probably all been there and hung out with the cows and the chickens and the sheep at Old Sturbridge Village. Um, and I made my way out here when I moved to Waltham to be a writer at the Bedford Minuteman, which is also a wicked local paper. I worked for six years as a reporter in Southbridge, um, which is near Sturbridge, Webster, Dudley, and Oxford. I graduated high school in 2004 and eventually graduated college um, at the end of 2008, early 2009, because I did like four and a half years. It was the worst time to graduate college because the economy kind of exploded. And then I picked the very lucrative career of writing. <laughs> um, but it actually worked out well. I was not a motivated student growing up. Um, I was really in my own world, super shy. That's me at my first job on the last day. Um, that was like my 300th issue and I was very proud of it. <laughs> Um, but like I said, growing up, I was not motivated. Um, I had a very small learning disability that wasn't big enough to be paid attention to, but made my life harder. <laughs> um, my parents were also of the mindset of, go to school, do your work, we're here for you, we'll sit down with you and help you, but it'll end up kind of being difficult because then we'll start yelling about spelling tests, and so maybe just work on your own. <laughs> um, they were very supportive, but neither of them took, to the, took the traditional route either. They went to technical school. My mother's a hairdresser, and my dad is an engineer, and he went to school before the time where he needed a bachelor's. So they kind of didn't know the whole college route. They were just like, go to school, graduate. You'll probably do something like college or tech school after. So I decided, OK, I'm going to go to um, community college, because I know that I can't live in the freshman dorms. I'm too shy, I'm too scared, I'm too nervous. I don't want to do it. I'm just going to go to community college. So I jumped in my little Mazda with my no little new Nokia phone so I would be safe. And <laughs> I made the ride out to Holyoke, um, which is out near Springfield. And I went to Holyoke Community College for two years. And I did all of the prerequisite courses, your Englishes and maths. Um, and I kind of had the same perspective that I think a lot of people do when it comes to community college that it's kind of the place you go where you're, when you're dragging your feet or you don't want to. But when I showed up, it was a place where people wanted to get work done. They were either coming because they couldn't afford four-year school and they really wanted to get to four-year school someday. And so they were getting all the, like I said, prereqs done early. Or they were coming back to school and they were like, okay, this is like a job, I'm gonna go in, go home. And I kind of thrived in that. I was still really shy. I still wasn't the perfect student. Um, you know, I struggled with mental health issues, kind of like um, you were talking about earlier. That kind of ran my life a little bit. But stepping out and being in community college was a way to kind of start getting up and over that, start learning more about myself and how I can take care of myself. And then after the two years, I thought, OK, what do I do now? I got through community college, I'm good. I think I'll go to four-year school with my best friend because I like her, we can live together, and then I'll figure out what I want to do and then I'll be good to go. So I went to Salem State, lived with my best friend. She was an honor student, we lived in honors housing, I wasn't. 
I was a fish out of water pretending to be an honor student. Everybody thought I was because I was a nerd and a loner. So I was like, great. I got my camouflage on. I'm, I'm all set. Um, and I did even a little bit better there. I got out. I was more social. I was still kind of a loner. I did my own thing. I didn't do my homework as much as I should. But then I went to my first news writing class and met my mentor and now really close friend um, who's been by my side since then. Her name is Peg. She's a superwoman. She's a reporter. She was a speechwriter in Washington, D.C. She traveled the world. She lived on Antarctica. Um, because one day she saw an ad that said, do you want to cook for these government geologists on Antarctica? And she said, sure. Jumped on a plane and went. <laughs> Um, so she's always kind of been my guide when it comes to being more spontaneous and out there. Um, so I ended up not being able to write at the school paper until the very last year because I was working two jobs. But when I was there, Peg really mentored me and pushed me to make cold calls. And cold calls was what got me my first job. Um, I called like 100 different newspapers before I graduated. Um, and I got my first interview about two or three months before I graduated and I got hired at the paper that was my childhood paper, um, which is in the evening news offices. And like I said, I worked there for six years. And so I'm like, great, I'm a reporter, I'm not making that much money, but I like it, I'm living at home, my parents are very supportive. Six years ended and I thought, I'll move forward. So I applied for a job uh, at a Fitchburg paper and I went. And I got in my little car and I drove an hour and I'm like, here I am, I'm in my little similar suit, I'm ready to go, I'm gonna be a real like big time reporter. And I get there and it was awful. It was the worst experience I'd ever had. They wanted me to do two stories a day, plus go to the courthouse, pull all the court cases for the day, which in Fitchburg is a lot, uh, <laughs> write all of those up, then cover breaking news, and then also work on a story that would be featured in the Sunday paper. And I'm like, okay, everybody's nervous on the first day. I'm shadowing the girl who's leaving. And I'm like, it's okay, I can do this, I can do this. I'm just nervous. Get back to the office, they don't have a computer for me. So I'm like, okay, I'll just kind of sit <laughs> and figure out what to do. The editor comes out, starts screaming at the night reporter. I'm like, oh, this is just... <laughs> A newsroom. <laughs> it's a unique place. It's always been unique. It's where all the misfits meet up, including myself. So I'm like, it's okay. And then they're like, okay, we're going to need you to move your car now because during the day it's all right, but someone got shot there last night. So we're going to need you to move to the nighttime parking lot. And I was like, <laughs> sure. Got in my little car, left, and cried all the way home. Thought to myself, I can't do this. I can't give them what they need, and I can't be somewhere like that. It just doesn't feel safe or right. My gut was telling me, don't do this. My parents are going to be so mad. Get home. I tell them, they're like, you can't do this. <laughs> you can't go back there. Your gut's telling you not to. And so I went back. I said to them, listen, I can't give you what you need. You need someone with more experience. I just can't do this. And they said, okay. So I left. I called one of the reporters that I used to work with. I asked if he needed anybody to freelance. He said yes. I started freelancing, and now I work for the company that I was freelancing for. So I know I need to wrap up, but my, the moral to my story is listen to your gut. Even if you're not driven by something all-encompassing that you want to do when you, you know, quote-unquote, grew up, listen to your gut. Do something that you love, because it's not about the money. It's about being comfortable and happy. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, life is about knowing, not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. And that has summed up my life forever. <laughs> and now I'm here. I'm really happy. I'm getting to know this community after six months, and it's been a really great experience. Will I be a reporter forever? I don't know. Um, and I'm kind of just going with my gut from here. So thank you. Thank you, Joy. Next, Brianna Lumbert. All right, hi everyone. Um, as you said, my name is Brianna Lumbert. I am 24 years old, and I have lived here in Westford throughout my entire life. Success is a word I have thus far grown to understand that 
It's not only loving what you do in life, but doing something that allows you to do more of what you love. I'm gonna say it one more time. That it's not only loving what you do in life, but doing something that allows you to do more of what you love. So what I mean by that, in the best way possible, is having a career you look forward to being a part of and contributing to every day, but also appreciating what that career allows you to do outside of work, whether it be time for money, uh, taking time uh, and having money for kids, to travel, to buy a home, to buy nice clothes, buy a new car, have the weekends off, etc. Anything that you like to do. So with that said, I'm currently in search to find that successful career for myself, but I've also have had a lot of success on my way to finding it. Throughout my whole education, I had the non-traditional way of the schools I attended. Um, I struggled in school from as early as I can remember with reading and comprehension. Um, so my mom moved me to a charter middle school. Uh, probably have heard of it, Innovation Academy. It was called Murdoch when I went. Then I went to Neshoba Valley Technical High School right here in Westford. And at Neshoba, I took a very different shop <laughs> than most females, um, being a part of the auto body shop. And from being a part of that shop, I actually went up co-op. Uh, for a co-op is what the tech offers to people who do well academically and do well in their shops by junior year, you're able to every other week go to experience the trade in the real world rather than just in school and um, every other week kind of get the true experience in the work, uh, work field. I got hired at Jake's Auto Body in Littleton, Massachusetts. I love to work on cars. Um, it's one of the most fulfilling fe feelings, finishing a car. Um, I take pride in it, and it's really nice to give your car back to people. Um, it's kind of a relief for them to have it a lot better than how they brought it to the shop. <laughs> Um, I enjoyed high school more than ever. I have my mom to thank for that, for sure. Um, I found a trade for life, regardless if I made it my career. And I did really well making new friends, playing sports, and surprisingly, academically. Um, I graduated third in my class, which was a huge accomplishment for me at the time. Um, as I came to graduation, <laughs> I remember high school was a total blur. Um, you know, it was so fun and I really enjoyed learning for once. I kind of came at a standstill. I didn't know whether to continue, go on to college, risk, you know, feeling worried again to be behind everybody else learning uh, or to pursue auto body. So I talked with my mom and, of course, last minute, <laughs> I decided to uh, apply to schools. Uh, we took all of my spring break visiting a college each day. <laughs> I decided to attend Plymouth State University. I majored in exercise physiology, um, mostly because I based it off two things I really like, which is sports and science. I loved what I was learning, so I had hoped that I was on the right track into finding something I wanted to do. I took advantage of the opportunities at college. Um, I did lots of service work uh, in the States, as well as I led a group every year to Nicaragua to do service work. And I made some forever friends, built uh, amazing um, relationships with my professors, and I had a lot of fun. Uh, for all those kids that are going to college, the most important thing that I've learned is balance. Um, obviously, I put a lot of time in academics, but balance is huge. So college was a success for me because I found that balance. I graduated summa cum laude, also a huge accomplishment for me. Um, and I actually landed a job right out of school. Boston Heart Diagnostics, it's located in Framingham, Massachusetts. I became a specimen processor during research on cardiovascular disease. It 
was a job you post on Facebook and love watching the likes rack up and people be like, wow, that's awesome, good for you. <laughs> that seems so impressive. And I remember driving to work every day and like, you know, trying to remind myself, oh wow, look at my post, it has like whatever, hundreds of likes. Driving to work. Wow. Slowly those likes meant absolutely nothing. And I hated my job. <laughs> um, it was nothing what I really wanted to do with my life. And I felt at 22, there was no way I should be this unhappy. I think an important lesson in that is that especially kids nowadays, we go on social media and we compare ourselves. It's like inevitable. Um, it's so easy to think you should do something just to come off as impressive or successful to others. Um, I definitely did it. I definitely have posted things that, you know, I say just to see other people's reactions. Um, but in the end, I've learned that just because what you portray on social media, if you're dreading every day doing something um, or trying to portray that you're happy and you're not, um, there's really no success in that whatsoever. Um, so after seven months of trying to stick it through, because I wanted to make sure I hated it, <laughs> um, I quit. And um, I had to backtrack in order to move forward. So I leaned on what I still knew I loved, auto body. And um, for five months, I was actually working about 60 hours a week, because while doing auto body, I was trying to explore other jobs, personal training, things that my major... Um, you know, acquired for me to be able to get a job in. So uh, 60 hours a week, though, is a very long week. Uh, I figured, well, I was young, try it out. Don't ever want to go back. Um, but um, then I realized I really wanted to go back to school. Um, my advisor in college told me, um, You're, you belong in grad school, keep going. That was a huge kind of thing that stuck with me. So I realized I need to go back to school. So um, money is unfortunately a huge thing with that. And um, I decided to backtrack to more things that have always intrigued me. The military. Join the Massachusetts National Guard. I just got back, actually, this October from seven months of training. I absolutely loved it. Uh, it opened up more opportunities for me. Um, and however, now that I get to go to grad school, uh, without money aspect, I still have to figure out what the heck I want to do. So I um, have been looking into different options, trying to apply to places to see if I can get some experience before going to grad school. Uh, but now doing auto body uh, and just figuring out what my next step is. Uh, at 24, I really thought I know what I would want to do by now. Uh, my worst fear is making all these decisions and then doing something I don't want to do. However, the reality is, if you work hard, focus on what makes you happy, educate yourself, and explore your options. Most importantly, stop trying to find success. Success, success will actually find you. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. And now, Mary Claire O'Neill. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Claire O'Neill. I have lived in Westford for almost 25 years, which still makes me a blow-in. And fun fact, we found out um, this, this evening that I moved to Westford on the exact day that Brianne was born. <laughs> so somehow we were meant to meet. Um, I grew up in Waltham, and I, growing up in Waltham, wanted to be one of two things. I either wanted to be an actress, or I wanted to be a teacher. Well, the actress piece kind of took care of itself by the time I was finishing middle school because, well, I had no talent. <laughs> so that wasn't gonna happen. And the teacher piece, I was still interested in it, but quite honestly, I was in middle school. I had more important things to think about than my future. So I kind of stuck it in my back pocket and it sat there for a long, for a long time. I went on to high school. And I have to say I was a pretty mediocre student. I didn't try as hard as I could have. 
Um, I was really involved in the social minefield that high school can be. I think I suffered from some depression back then, but quite honestly, nobody talked about stuff like that back then, unfortunately. Um, but I persevered, got through high school, I uh, was lucky enough to go to Fairfield University, and it was there where I really kind of came into my home academically. I worked really hard. I earned grades that I was proud of, and, and I enjoyed the experience. But there's one aspect of my college, well, the very beginning of college, that really kind of sticks out. Is it's orientation. Parents are there. I'm sitting in a classroom in Canisius Hall, and I say to my, and there's a gentleman from, I don't know where, saying, well, we had to pick a major, we had to fill out these forms. And I'm filling out the form, and I look at my mom, and I say, oh, I'm gonna be a psychology major. She just kind of looks at me. She said, oh, you wouldn't like that. You should be an English major. I'm like, all right, well, I'm 17. I've never been to college. She's been to college. She was an English major. She's doing okay. Okay, I'll be an English major. So I did that. I did that for two years. And I, I didn't hate it because I really like to read and I like to write, so to check those boxes. But there was no passion in it. It, it didn't excite me. It, didn't, it wasn't something I really wanted to do. I just did it. So at the beginning of my junior year, I became a psych major. And that was great. I loved my psychology classes. They were so interesting. They just really excited me and, and engaged me and wanted, you know, inspired me to learn more. It was, it was a good move on my part. But then, as happens with all college students, you have to face the reality that after college comes life. And you have to figure out what it is you're going to do. And I had no idea. I knew I loved psychology, but I didn't know much more than that. So, after college, I did what you would expect all psychology majors to do, and I went to law school. That makes no sense at all. I get that, and especially back then. Now, it's more common. Nobody did that. So, why did I go to law school? Well, I come from a family of lawyers. My father was a lawyer. My grandfather was a lawyer. Two of my uncles were lawyers. And I currently had, a, at that time, had a cousin in law school continuing the family tradition. So I thought, well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. And anyways, how hard could law school be? <laughs> ha. Law school was really, really hard. I, I worked my tail off. And I, I went to BC Law, and I liked it. I met some amazing people. Um, it was a good experience. You know, intellectually, it really challenged me. And it was a good experience, but again, I didn't love it. I just got through it. But I kept saying to myself, well, it's okay, because when I graduate, I'll go on to be an, att an attorney, and I'll make a lot of money, and that'll be great. So I graduate. I go to work with a family firm, and I hate it. I was miserable. Every single day waking up was such pain. I can still remember. I did it for eight years. It was painful. I love the piece where I helped people because I, I, I'm a helper at heart. I want to help people, but not in that way, not with that avenue. So somehow I persevered for eight years. In the meantime, got married, had three kids. Um, and then after our second son, we have three boys, after our second son was born, my husband and I talked about it and thought, well, now would be a good time for me to stay home full time. So I did, and I was really, really grateful for the opportunity, and I had always wanted to be able to spend some time at home with my kids, and I was also really happy I didn't have to practice law anymore. And so I did, and I stayed, stayed home, and I got pretty involved in the community. I did community things. I was really involved in the schools, and I realized that when I was going in to volunteer at my kids' classrooms, that I loved being in a school. Remember, I said I wanted to be a teacher, right? So I, I loved the energy, I loved the vibe, I loved everything about it, and I decided that I thought I would go into education. I did a ton of research, I talked to a lot of people, I shadowed people, I did a bunch of different things. And so at the ripe old age of 45, I went to graduate school to get my Master's of Education in School Counseling. It was fabulous. It just spoke to me. It is so meaningful to me. It took me four years to get through. 
It was so hard. I look back on it now and I think, how the heck did I do that? I had three kids, none of whom drove, a part-time job, I was serving a term on the Westford School Committee, and my husband travels all the time. <laughs> but I did it because I was passionate about it, and I loved it, and I just knew it was the right thing for me to do. So it took four years, but I did it. The only downside about that period were the constant conversations I had with people. And the conversations would go something like this. Oh, so what are you up to, Mary Claire? And I would say, oh, well, I'm in grad school. I'm getting my master's in education. I'd tell them a little bit. And they'd say, oh, that's great. Pause. But aren't you a lawyer? And for so long, at the very beginning, I kept doubting myself. They're right. I'm crazy. Why would I walk away from a career? I felt trapped by law. Why would I walk away from that? Why would I do it? And then I'd have to talk myself back down. My husband had to do a lot of that. Talk myself back down and say, okay, no, this is the right path for me. So I stuck with it. I graduated, got a job right out of school at a local high school. This is my eighth year, and, and I love it. I don't love it every day. I love it most days. And I love most of the job, not every aspect of the job, because nothing is perfect, right? But it's been the, the best thing that I ever did. So how does that define success for me? For me, it wasn't being the major my mom wanted me to be. She was so well-intentioned, but it wasn't right for me. It wasn't being in the career path, the law, that so many people in my family found success in. That just wasn't right for me. And it wasn't giving in to, like, really a good amount of pressure from a lot of different factors, including family, who wanted me to give up what, what, what was really meaningful for me. So I say to all the students out there, when you're thinking about what you want to do, be yourself and make sure you find something that's meaningful for you. It really matters. Don't be afraid to take chances. It's scary, but you can do it. And then when you make mistakes, because you will, we all do, learn from the mistakes, figure out what went wrong, and then just keep going forward and don't look back. So thank you for letting me share your, my career journey with you, and I wish you all the best of luck with yours. Thank you, Mary Claire. Uh, Charlie Silva. Good, e good evening, everyone. I have to use my cheat notes and, and my glasses. So I would like to thank all of you for be taking time uh, of your busy schedule to be here tonight. It says a lot, and especially to the parents that actually put this all together. Um, this is something I've Believe it or not, I've been doing my trade now for 37 years. Very kind of scary even thinking about that. Um, but for the last 20 years, I've been thinking about getting kids into the trades. Not enough kids are getting into the trades. So that's really what you know, I want to talk about tonight is, you know, because that's where I am. I didn't go to college. I, I wasn't a great student in high school um, because I was gonna, always going to go into the family business. And I always said, well, what good is high school anyways? What do I need all that for? Well, I was terribly wrong, of course. But... Um, so my advice is to still study hard. Um, so let's see here. Um, I think that there's way too much pressure put on kids nowadays about what they should want to do, what they need to do, whether they're going to go to college. You know, right out of high school, how many of you really know what you want to do? How many of us really knew what we wanted to do, right? 1%, 5%, who knows? And uh, so I think don't put pressure wanting to know or having to know what you want to do for the rest of your lives. And when I graduated high school, I knew I was going to go into the family business. I was kind of fortunate. I had no idea where it was going to take me, of course, but I did know that I was going to go into the family business. But that journey started when I was 12. My mom made me work in the, uh, for my uncles and my grandfather to keep me out of trouble, and it worked most times. Um, you know. She, my mom was a single mom, she did the best she could, but she made the right decisions for me at that time. And when I graduated high school, and even to this day, there was a stigma about getting into the trades. And I think a lot of you would agree with me on that one. You know, you're gonna be a blue collar worker, what are you gonna do? But I guarantee you, I love my job more than anyone I went to school with. And that's something I need to, you know, you guys need to understand. No matter what you um, do, and like everybody's talked tonight, we've all made the choice of, you know, we're happy now or what 
our journey was to get us there. And whether you get there in the first several years or it takes 10 or 15 or whatever it might be, um, you know, you took however many years, right? But you're happy, and that's really what we're all here to tell you all, is you have to love what you do. Um, and that's just, it, that's really one of the driving forces here, I think. Um, and remember, don't be afraid to fail. Trust me, I have failed many times, but it makes you stronger, it gets you, you figure out how to be better at what you did, the mistakes you made, you will learn from it. And, you know, not that you want to fail, but failing is not a bad thing, and we all do it. Excuse me. Well, as I said, I've been doing this for 37 years. I started in 1981, and working alongside my uncles in the company Silver Buzz Construction, I learned doing things the right way, but there was only three of them and me, and me being the youngest, you know, I was the, uh, uh, you know, always having to do the dirty work most of the time. But with hard work and perseverance, you know, you become better, you become stronger. You know, I mean, being technically raised by three uncles on my full-time job and in my summers and my early years, you realize that, you know, you don't call in sick with the sniffles. You know, you want to set yourself apart from everybody else that you're competing against, right? So if you're all competing for the same, this is all of you in the workforce, you want to be above everybody else, because guess what? If you're all really good, your chances aren't as good to get the job. So guess what? Work a little harder. Your boss asks you to work late, work the weekend. Do it. Oh, I want to go to the beach with my friends. Guess what? Don't go to the beach with your friends. There's somebody's asking you to stay later, work harder. Sell, you set yourselves apart from everybody else. One of my favorite words to teach kids is the word opportunity. It doesn't always come around twice, never mind once, or you might not recognize it, right? And going through the family business since 1981 when I started, I eventually became a partner in the business and slowly bought, bought out my uncles, and now I own it to this day. And actually, been fortunate enough by working hard, I grew at 1,200% what they did. And, you know, working hard gets you all of those things, but I've worked really hard, like a lot of you will, but when you love it, it's not really that much work, as much as you have. We all can look back at days that you're like, boy, this job's tough. And as far as, you know, and I don't know how many of you know this, but we're fortunate enough to do the TV show, The Sold House, and that's, you know, a very small percentage of our business. And these are my three apprentices from two years ago. I don't know if any of you have seen it or anything, but... Uh, Bailey was from Maine, Nathan was from West Bridgewater, and Austin beside me was from South Carolina. And all of them uh, applied to this and worked extremely hard alongside me for 10 weeks. And it really actually changed my uh, outlook on kids and seeing the difference of what they wanted in this world. And sadly enough, Austin, who I took a very, very dear liking to, passed away. Um, it was devastating to all of us. He had a pre-existing pre condition, um, and he passed away just over a year ago. Um, but he had the dream uh, to build his mom a house, and it's truly emotional to me to, still to this day, and uh, it was very sad. But to see these kids that, that took, they never knew each other, they showed up 10 weeks and worked hard together. Once again, working hard, getting ahead, and making a difference, right? And I was going to sum it up by simply saying, it also, getting back to the trades for me, is you know, don't let a stigma, whether you want to be a plumber, electrician, auto body, whatever it might be, your passion is your passion. I mean, I have two daughters. They went to college, or well, one's still in college, um, which is great, but that was their passion. And who knows exactly what they'll stay with. But in the trades, every five of us that are retiring, only two are replacing us. Right? That's unsustainable you will be able to make a very good living, but once again, by working hard, all right? That's just my take from this whole thing. When you think you've worked hard, work harder. Set yourself apart from everybody else. Thank you, Charlie. And our last speaker, Claire O'Brien.
Hi, I'm a mom of an eighth and a ninth grader here in Westford, but I'm also one of seven kids, and I'm fifth in line. And as I was growing up, my older siblings, just a few years older than me, um, I watched them as they went through high school, and they were kind of at that point where they're starting to panic a little bit about college. And the, what I saw most of all was that everybody was dodging my father because my father liked to get each of us individual and sit down and have a conversation about what did we want to do with our life. Well, they'd be so nervous, no one wanted to have that conversation, but somehow I watched each of them move forward in choosing a college and going through the application process and doing really well. In reality, it intimidated me, the whole, pro the whole piece of watching them do that. It came my turn and I thought, there is no way I can com com compete with this. What am I going to do? I started to look around and try and figure something else out. Now, although we had seven kids, my parents still thought it was OK to bring exchange students into our house, because the more, the merrier. So we had people from all over the world. And it used to just amaze me to watch them and their risk taking and their sense of adventure, the way they left their homes and they left everything behind just to walk into a new opportunity. I saw the girl next door, exactly a year older than me, and she decided to be an exchange student in Brazil for the year. And I thought, hmm, this is what I could do. This is how I can get out of this whole thing. So I brought the idea out to my parents. They said, well, if you apply and are accepted to at least two colleges, go ahead and give it a shot. And so I applied for and received a Rotary Exchange Scholarship to the Netherlands for a year. It was an incredible experience. I had the opportunity to live with three different host families, to um, go to high school, although I finished high school here before I left. Um, I went for high school again without credit, so I got to go to school and not have to take, take um, tests or get grades, do homework. Um, uh, I can Nederlands praten. I learned to speak Dutch fluently. And I learned a lot about myself. Um, I learned to have patience. I learned a lot of self-confidence. When you do something in another language, everything else seems easy afterwards when you switch back to English. Um, I learned a lot about uh, resilience. There are a lot of challenges when you're in another culture and you're just trying to figure out um, how exactly am I going to make my way through. And I came back a year later to start school in New York at Fordham University. And I had applied as a theater major and realized that um, I wasn't going to be able to be pigeonholed that much at that point. You know, I had learned about so many different opportunities and so many great perspectives and ways of thinking that I thought, I need something broader. So I started in uh, communications. And that worked well as I moved along into my first and second year of college. And then I realized I needed to go abroad again. I missed that international piece. So I decided to study abroad in France. And I switched my major again to French in order to do it. And I finally graduated then with the, experience, with the um, fluency in French as well. When I finished, I had that moment of panic that I remembered from high school, from senior year of high school thinking, oh no, what's next? And it was worrisome, and I felt almost paralyzed. So I stayed on campus through the summer and was offered a job working with some French students who were there for the summer, um, for a summer program. And from there, I was offered a job on campus to work in residence life. And suddenly, I realized there was a whole field of working on campus. And one of the things that started as I worked on campus was uh, free tuition for any graduate school. So my father, of course, said, well, why don't you take a class? And uh, I picked a class called Counseling Students from Other Cultures. And that just sucked me right in. And I immediately went for a master's in counseling. I did that at University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh, working with primarily international students, helping them adjust to the American culture. Um, I, I missed the East Coast, and I wanted to head back after that. And I took a job working at Boston College then in um, residence life, working with international students, living with American students. And taking that international perspective I had and sort of looking at it from the other side and helping the students through that experience. It was a wonderful job. It also offered me the free tuition, 
which my father said, just take a class. <laughs> don't, don't get committed, but just take a class. So I took a course on global education. And of course, soon I was in the doctoral program in higher education administration, focusing on specifically international education. It, it has been a joy to work in the field and work at universities over the years, working, creating study abroad programs, working, welcoming students in from other countries, taking that um, idea of bringing the world and bringing it to ourselves. And so it's not just too far, it's not unattainable. And in all the years that I worked in um, colleges and universities, I would say, um, probably one of the most valuable things that I learned in working with students is that a lot of times students feel that same confusion and that same paralyzation that I felt. Having a student oftentimes walk in my office and say, um, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know what, what my major is. I'm, I'm not sure what, what I should choose and being panicked about it and trying to explain to them it's really not just what you're going to do with your life. It's about choosing something that really interests you and then moving forward from that point on. You can't figure it all out. I can tell you from um, all the courses I took in student development, it's the type of thing where logically, um, at the age of middle school, high school, and definitely into college, um, our, our, children, our children's development is not there yet. And they need some time to explore, and it's OK to not know what they want to do. The gap here is something that you hear a lot about now. It's pretty common. There are lots of different ways to do a gap year. You can do it by hiking through Nepal. You can do it in a homestay like I did. You can split it into different sections, do volunteerism, do community service, um, learn another language. There are lots of organizations out there that work with students to do that. Um, I worked with uh, Academic Programs International, which was fantastic. ARC, ARCC, is another great program. It involves a lot of planning, but um, it's the type of thing that um, opens a lot of doors. And it, although it looks like it was logical where I went, I had no idea where it would take me, but it definitely helped me to view things different and to get a better perspective on things. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, for the last couple minutes, if uh, all of the speakers would join me up here, we're going to have just a, a, a couple of minutes to ask some questions and uh, hear from you. So the idea of hearing seven very different stories and knowing that the room is filled with even more stories, because I know many of you um, have also had very different stories and so for the students perspective sometimes if if you only have a few people who you're able to hear the stories from then it, it, it can limit our perspective and so the idea of hearing from more people I think is something that's uh, very beneficial before we get into the questions could we thank the parents for the Westford parents group would you guys uh, stand up the all of the different parents who, who are part of the challenge success thank you for organizing this for us um, so I have a question for you all to consider just to get things going. If you were to talk to your 16 or 17 year old self now, um, what little pearl of wisdom might you share? Um, probably just to um, enjoy the ride as much as you can, not to get too caught up in the, like I said, I was paralyzed. And, and fearful, and to really just try and trust that, that um, your heart's going to lead you where you need to be. I would say to trust yourself, to trust your instincts. So if I had been able to do that when I was 17 and picking my major in college, I maybe would have just ended up as a psych major all along. Um, I think I'm still figuring that out. Uh, but I would say probably to explore more, um, kind of explore what's out there more, uh, rather than just the typical, you hear nursing major, uh, business, all that, see what else is out there before you kind of just pick something based on, you know, a couple things. I think I'd say to myself, it's going to get better. Um, step away from the television, and maybe do a little bit better in school. Uh, but still be curious about what you want to do, still be into the things that you love and don't feel sorry for liking those things. Um, 
I would tell myself to stop worrying about what other people think and just focus on what you would like to do and what's best for you. Um, I think if I could give myself advice, I would say to explore and actually reach out to anyone that's in fields that I think would be a good potential fit for me and just ask questions or even better, like ask if I could shadow for a day or half a day and actually see what their world looks like. That would have made the decisions a lot easier for me. I have a bunch of actually, but with enough time. But uh, I would say go with your gut feeling sometimes, nothing wrong with that, you know, and then along the way, you know, if you feel like you should change because the gut feeling changed, don't be afraid to change. And some of us, you know, have done it through our, you know, period of our life, 10 years or whatever. Um, but go with it. But most importantly, what I tell you guys, start your retirements very, very early, your retirement funds. Trust me. I think everybody would agree here, us yeah. older people, start your retirement accounts. You're never too young. <laughs> it's very true. Um, one, other, one other thing for, for all of you uh, to consider, too. Um, now knowing that, I mean, there was all very different paths. Every single one of you took a, a different path. There were um, some slight detours or even just where you are right now might be very different than what you, where you thought you would be um, when you were 17 or 18. The people that you interact with on a regular basis, the professionals or the people that you're working with, how many of you would say that the people that you interact with, while their, their story is not the same as yours, that you find people who have as unique a story as yours. Would you just raise your hand if you feel like the people that you are interacting with, their stories are also very different? And I'm gonna throw you, because I'm listening to your story, right? And you said right from the very beginning, like, okay, you were going into the trade, but did you think when you were 18 years old that you would be working regularly on a television show? Truthfully, when I graduated, when I was 18 years old, I remember saying, and keep in mind, I mean, the older people here will know where I'm coming from. I mean, I made $96 a week working for my grandfather. He was not the most generous guy with the paycheck. <laughs> my truck payment was $160 a month plus insurance. So I, I realized you had to work hard. And um, when I graduated high school, I remember saying, if I could ever make $50,000 a year, I'd be set for the rest of my life. Certainly, that's what I thought, because that was the number back then. You know, you, you, know, you think about it, 96 bucks a week times 52. I mean, if you all said if you could make it 50. But no, I mean, it was not even in the picture. But truthfully, I just thought I'd be swinging a hammer. Um, and I, I don't anymore. I truthfully miss it. But I run the business. I grew the business. You know, I keep anywhere from 30 to 50 people busy in the course of the day with my guys' subcontractors. But no, I would never even dreamed where, never mind the TV part, but just truthfully growing the business and, and wanting that challenge of that. And it's not cut out for everybody, truthfully, but, but no. Thank you. Um, now, we have a microphone. Um, Mr. Sanders has a microphone down there. So that if there are people in the audience who have any specific questions for an individual or even for the group, we'd like to open that up for people. Is there anybody who has a, a, a burning question that they are thinking about? It does, just take one to start, that's true. Well, we have one right back here. You'll get your steps in, Mr. Sanders, which is good. Thank you, and thank you so much for sharing your story. It's, they're, they're awesome to hear, and I think there's a lot of great takeaways. I'd say, you know, a lot of us are parents here, so what would you say maybe is a key piece of your advice as we're raising our children, you know, whether it's encouragement or you know, something that we can do to support them um, as they move through their journey. Just takes one to start. I'll go, I don't shy away. Oh, we'll get one <laughs> um, I think really, because I've been through it, my two daughters and, and you know, never mind what I did, but you know, encouragement of you know, what, neither one of them, as my oldest is out now for seven years, but didn't know when she went to college exactly what she'd be doing. But I think what I always tell people is, um, you know, when you're kids, and as we all know it is, knowing one of the most important things is that your kids know that you're there for them, as you know, as you know. but I mean, just the encouragement of, yeah, you want to follow that path of, of whatever it might be, but just knowing that you're th they're there, as long as they know that you're there to back them up and support it, and then maybe you can steer some guidance along the way, you know, instead of going down, a, why don't you explore this, don't, never have a dead end, you know, always a fork in the road. 
Um, I would say listen. Um, just make sure that they know that you are there to listen to them and not judge them if they're scared or are doing something that they think you may not approve of or want to go a different direction than you um, than they think you're anticipating. So uh, just a kind of a non-judgmental ear would be my advice. Um, don't blow them off when they say they want to go into something creative. <laughs> I think saying to my parents that I wanted to be a writer made them go, that's nice. <laughs> um, they weren't not supportive, but I think they thought this isn't practical. If your kid doesn't want to do something practical, support them, maybe give them some other creative options that they can do alongside their you know, passion, um, but don't just nod and smile <laughs> or even laugh. <laughs> I would say have faith in your kids. Have faith in what they say. When they say, my oldest son, ever since he's a little boy, I want to work with animals, I want to work with animals, I want to work with the outdoors. He has an undergrad, he has a graduate degree, and he's currently doing a fellowship with the National Park Service. He's in his happy place. And we had faith in him to follow what he liked. And I'm a, I could go on all day about this because I am a high school guidance counselor. But, Kids need to trust their instincts. They need to know that what they like is okay, whether it's creative, whether it's engineering, and you're a family of writers, whatever it may be, they need to have the f they know that you support them no matter what they do, and that they can build up the confidence to go after it. I would just um, add to that. I think everything that everyone said is what I would say as well. Um, it, I know as a parent it's really hard to not have a price tag attached to that approach um, as you're thinking about tuition and college tuition, which direction they can go in. But what I would say is that it's, it's a very common thing for a student to start at a university and change majors repeatedly. It's, it's definitely an okay thing and the curriculum is often designed in a way that they're taking classes to introduce them to a variety of topics so that ideally they can have a better idea as they get older. Um, okay, so 16-year-old yourself, what was the definition of success and current version of yourself, what's the definition of success? And to constrain it, let's try to do each of those in one word. <laughs> if you do two, we won't boo you off the stage, though. <laughs> Did you get all that? No. So, so what, 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 how would you have defined success at 16? What would you think your future self Successful Pop popular. self. Popular. Like. At 16, okay. I would have said popular. And then now? <laughs> Fulfilled. Okay. Um, probably money, for sure. Uh, now, happiness. I have three for my first one, and it was Saturday Night Live. <laughs> 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 and now it's just family. I'd say approval, and now it would be peace. 16-year-old me would say fame. Um, current me would say um, balance. 16-year-old, uh, I just thought of money, just to make money. Um, and now, uh, just happy and, and you know, loving what I do. I can tell I'm related to Nick through marriage, who's my husband's cousin, um, because I would have said fame as well, and balance as well, as a lot of people I think would say balance. Well, I did take the gap year, but I think if I hadn't taken the gap year, um, it would have taken me a lot longer to figure out, to have enough self-confidence to figure that I could go in a direction that interested me rather than um, a, a sense of competition, maybe even within my siblings. I think it would have helped me mature a lot and be more ready 
for what came next and gave me more definition about what I want. Because um, I went to college at 17, that's pretty young. Um, so I think it would have helped. I tried to encourage one of my kids to do a gap year. Um, I thought it might not hurt him. He didn't want to, so he didn't. But what he did do, which is interesting, is he did a service year after college. It sort of served as a gap year. Um, I would say absolutely, uh, mostly because I feel like a gap year would give you time to like self-reflect almost uh, after already experienced college and understanding what it's about. Um, also give you opportunity. I kind of wish I had my high school life in college. And the way I mean that is high school, I was able to do something in school, really like it, but also then go in the real world and see how much it changed and see if I still liked it, which I did, which is awesome. But then I wish I could have done something like that, kind of a chip or act on something like that. I would advise everyone in this room to do, if they're going to college, do an internship or do, take a gap year, do something that gets you doing or trying new things rather than just learning all the times. Um, you know, you can love what you learn in things and that's great, but you know, there's a lot of you can't just go to school for one thing and then expect to do that thing. Like, there's many options. You don't really know which one fits you most. I knew I could not do anything but live at home when I was that age. I knew mentally I was not prepared for a gap year, so I'm glad that I had the realization that I should just uh, commute. I actually have discussed with my husband taking a gap year as an adult. <laughs> He is an alum of the Peace Corps and loved every single second living in Bolivia. And if you're a married couple, you can do the Peace Corps together um, and be kind of mentors to the younger people there. So we've actually discussed that, um, dropping our lives as reporters and running away and doing that. So we'll see if that gap year happens. I think I took a gap where a gap year in a way in the midst of college when I went through treatment, um, but I do not think that I was mentally prepared for any sort of gap year right after high school. But I do think that kind of shows me that I could have used some time, which I was forced to take at one point later. Um, but I could have used some time to figure out what some things were that I had to deal with. And I think for a lot of people, that way of taking a gap year could be working or could be traveling or could be Peace Corps. Uh, for me, it took a different form, but I think it all kind of comes back to the same thing. You're not ready for that next step and you have to figure out some stuff about yourself first. Uh, not to steal what Mary Claire said, but I think <clears throat> um, if I were to have taken a gap year, that one year at that age would have um, I would have been significantly more mature um, and more confident and more better suited to make the decision that was best for me rather than kind of what I thought I was supposed to do. The term gap year did not exist for me when I was a kid, <laughs> right? I, I couldn't even imagine the heckling my uncles would have given me. But in saying that, I fully support it because I would have supported it or did with my two daughters. Um, they didn't do it, but I... Every, I, I Everything that you guys have said, it was just absolutely, zero, no, there's no option on my end. But I think it is, once again, going back to what I said before, there's too much pressure on kids putting what they should do right away. I mean, nobody knows what the heck they're going to do for the rest of their lives. And I actually think it, that should be mandatory, but it should be definitely a higher percentage of kids that do it. Uh, one of the things that, uh, in listening to the responses too, that it, it makes me think about is, for us to remember as the adults that, um, yes, they've been saying for a number of years how the jobs that um, many of our children will have are things that we've never even heard of. Um, it happened a little bit for us, but it's happening exponentially now that, I mean, many of us sitting in the room are, we have job. well, I mean, yes, I principles did exist um, back then, but there are plenty of people who have jobs that, that didn't exist when, when we were students. And in listening to the seven different stories again, one of the things that I, I hope that you're able to take away tonight is the idea of needing to listen to our individual students. 
right? There are themes that, that ring through here from working hard and knowing the amount of work and the extra work that you need to do in order to be, um, in order to remain competitive. But then at the same time, when we talk about, okay, there's so much stress that we're putting on everybody and we're trying to balance everything. Some people worry about the wussification of America and that we're making things too soft for our kids. Well, I think one of the things that we can do if we balance this all together is the idea of if we listen individually to our students and don't try to compare them to somebody else's story. We can still have um, sound advice for them as to how they're going to pay their bills, how they're going to make a living. Practical advice, like um, one of the things that Joy said, you know, if somebody talks about something more creative, I sort of have been a fan of reminding people that the entertainment industry is America's largest export. So when people talk about the, the creative fields, it's like there are so many jobs that are attached to the creative fields that we shouldn't forget about that as well. But we can be reminding and helping our students to develop I think plans so that they can be productive and, and, and that they can support themselves, but we don't have to compare them to someone else. One of the scariest things that I heard tonight, honestly, was when Brianna was talking about the idea of the likes, right? And that's something where, yes, I have a Facebook account, but I can't relate to that, right? I can't relate to really caring about what anybody thinks about what I post online. And that's something that ages me, right? Because I know the students, many of them do care a great deal about that. And if that's the world that they're growing up in, where they're judging their success based on something that they're seeing on a screen, which most of the people that they're connected to are acquaintances at best. They might just be kids who they don't even talk to, but it's just somebody that's in school with them or even in another school or that they just had some other friend that is connected to them who has another mutual friend because it says, oh, we have 18 friends in common. So sure, I'll go ahead and, and let you be my friend because I want to have more friends than this other person. That's the world that they're growing up in. And if we're setting them up to judge their path based on somebody else, I fear that, that's, uh, that, 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 that we're setting them up for failure there. So if we're listening to their individual story, the thing, you guys all talked about passion. That came through clearly. Passion, passion, passion. Um, uh, Tony Wagner's a, a professor at Harvard who came and worked with the, um, our leadership team a couple years ago, and he talked about the three Ps. He talked about um, passion, play, and purpose. And if we help our children discover those things, help them discover through play, natural play, what they're passionate about, and then that can lead to their purpose, then that's going to help them lead fulfilling lives, which I think is another thing that we can be considering. Um, but just this idea of helping listen to them and not set them up by comparing them to somebody else. Seven completely different stories. The room's full of different stories. You can you know, there's a, a gazillion TED Talks now about people's stories and what they've done. And we have all these different examples of people who went to college, who didn't go to college, who dropped out of college, who did different things in order to chart their success, whether they planned it or whether it, they stumbled upon it. And so as the parents, I think we, we need to really figure out how we can best support them in their path without... Um, there's a new term I heard recently, which is a lawn, lawnmower, lawnmower parents. Has anybody heard that one? Instead of helicopter parents? Snowplow? Well, here it should be snowplow. Thank you. That's true. Right, but like lawnmower or snowplow parents, where instead of the helicopter parents, it's the parents are literally carving the path for the kids so that they can, And it's not to help them. It's so that then they don't end up in the weeds. And I'm like, that could also be pretty scary. Are there any other questions? I just rambled. I'm sorry. That's... Uh, it's my nature. Yes, we have a question way back. Is that Mr. Cutbill? Yeah. So I want to do something a little different. I want to ask the audience. If, if you think anything you heard tonight changed your mind about how you want to do this or how you want your kids to do it, could you just raise your hand? Okay. Thank you. I, I think we're done. <laughs> Did we? Did we have one? Did we have one one more question? We have one more question, and then we'll. This will be our last question. You Thomas, are you asking a question? Yes, Thomas. Mom and I are taking a gap year in the Peace Corps, so oh. good luck. <laughs> Learn to cook. A few of you mentioned um, mental illness and having difficulties while you were younger. 
My question is, what help would you have accepted at that age? I think parents always try and help their kids with those things, but it's always comes, sometimes comes with resistance. But at that age, what would have helped you get past it and move on so that your path would have been a little bit shorter to get to where you wanted to get to? So I would have been helped by counseling. Um, I wanted counseling, but back, I mean, I think I'm older than everyone here, but I, um, it wasn't a thing. It, there was a huge stigma and my mother forbade it. Just wasn't what you did. I really believe that if I would have been able to get counseling um, at a young age, that I would have been, it would have been a lot easier of a path. Um, it's hard to say. I was very secretive about my mental health issues. Um, I'm diagnosed with OCD. Uh, and even when I was a teenager, there was a huge stigma around it, especially something like that, which people have um, a perception of through the media, of just someone scurrying around checking light switches and washing their hands and stuff. Um, and, you know, when you want to be popular in high school, you hide that very much. So I don't know if I would have accepted help. Um, it was something that I had to come to terms with on my own. Um, a bit like addiction, you have to want to help yourself in order to get better, for real. Um, a little more support at home and to believe that it was an actual problem, kind of like what you were saying. Um, it was kind of like, work on it on your own, keep it to yourself. Um, so, and not in a mean way, just in like, this is something you can work on yourself. Um, just a little more support in that on that side of things. Uh, like Joy was saying, I think a lot of it does come down to the person wanting to get better, especially for certain mental illnesses. Um, for me, I didn't reach that part for a long time. But one thing I definitely could have used was, I think, a little more understanding and a little less judgment. I felt that every time I slipped up or had a hard day when I was recovering that um, certain people, even if they didn't say they were upset or judging me, I got that sense that they were frustrated that I wasn't further along. So I think just a little bit of, I guess, understanding that it can be a long road and that even if that person isn't in the place where maybe others may expect them to be, that there still is belief in them that forward motion is possible. Uh, with that, we'll wrap up the evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, drive safely. Take care. <laughs>